Hello, everyone. On behalf of the William T. Grant Foundation, it's my pleasure to welcome you all today. We are very excited to bring you this event, which is the fourth in a series of webinars focused on bringing critical race perspectives to research on the use of research evidence. This series was launched because we recognize that scholarship on evidence use, a still young but growing interdisciplinary field, was generating rich and important studies, but most were relatively silent on how race and racism shape what research is used, whose research is used, and how research is used. Previous webinars have addressed how race and racism infuse, infuse the production and use of research, as well as how the use of research is inevitably shaped by power and politics. This webinar offers concrete strategies and examples for how to incorporate attention to racialized dynamics and processes in your own research. Before diving into the focus of today's webinar, I want to briefly introduce the foundation's interest in research on research use. Because we have a number of folks joining us today who are part of our Reducing Inequality Funding Initiative, as well as others who may not be familiar with what is often called the URE field or use of research evidence field. As a foundation that invests considerable dollars in the use of research evidence to improve youth outcomes, we're interested in how to create conditions that support the use of research evidence in policy and practice. Thus, we launched an initiative in 2008 to understand the use of research evidence in decision making. This initiative was refocused in 2015 to support studies that examine strategies to improve the use of research evidence. In this initiative, we support research to identify, build, and test strategies that ensure research evidence is used in ways that benefit youth. We are primarily interested in research on improving the use of research evidence by state and local decision makers, mid-level managers, and intermediaries. As we have learned in previous webinars in this series, the use of research evidence is often shaped by racialized power dynamics that operate at the individual, interactional, and organizational levels. Thus, our call to researchers is to thoughtfully and meaningfully incorporate attention to these dynamics in your studies in service not only of furthering the field, but also the youth who are served by the organizations and systems you examine. Researchers interested in incorporating attention to race in studies of evidence use could ask a range of questions, such as, are studies by white researchers privileged in the use of research evidence? And if so, what practices can promote the racially equitable use of evidence in decision-making? Can racially unequal youth outcomes be more effectively improved by the use of research evidence that takes an anti-racist stance? Two overarching considerations to keep in mind when answering and asking questions such as these are, what is the racialized phenomenon you are trying to understand? Specifically, are you analyzing race as an identity, a process, or a structure, as a factor shaping the kind of research that is used? How are you accounting for and attending to racism? And then you might also need to consider what are the pro most appropriate methods to use that will capture this. For example, researchers interested in examining research practice partnerships as a strategy for improving the use of research evidence, a topic explored in a previous webinar, might examine how racialized power dynamics shape the formation and execution of partnerships. In such a study, observations of interactions between partners would be critical for exploring things like who speaks, what do they talk about when they speak? Who interrupts? Whose contributions are taken seriously and whose are dismissed? To answer such questions, the use of discourse analysis could illuminate racialized dynamics and identify key points where one could interrupt the reproduction of racial privilege, for example, to create more racially equitable dynamics. Findings might inform the development of practices that could be used across RPPs to attend to the creation and maintenance of racially equitable relationships across the life of a partnership. We're going to begin today by hearing from two researchers who do not study the use of research evidence, but who have made studying race and the ways it is produced, reproduced, and even challenged in social interactions and organizations central to their work. Our hope is that you will learn much from their experiences studying race and racism and the challenges that can come along with it. Um, and certainly we want you to think about how what they're doing can help us think about ways to fully and rigorously account for the complexity of race in our research. We'll begin by hearing from Amanda Lewis, Director of the Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy and College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Distinguished Professor of Black Studies and Sociology at the University of Illinois. And then we'll turn to Johanna Quinn, Assistant Professor of Sociology at Fordham University. 
Uh, thanks, Jenny. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, am I good? Yeah. I just want to say uh, to start with, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I want to thank the David T. Grant Foundation for hosting this and all the organizing team working behind the scenes. Um, and particularly Jenny Irons, who uh, I've had several conversations with in the planning of this and who explicitly invited me to be a little provocative today. So I'm gonna take her up on that. Um, and I wanna say, I'm particularly excited about this conversation because in some ways, these are the conversations I was sort of looking for when I shifted career paths um, some 25 years ago and decided to pursue research. Um, and the question we've been asked to think about today is um, how we think about measuring race and racism in our research. Um, and for me, this has been a journey over the last, as I said, few decades. What, what meaning do we make of race? How does it work? How does racism matter? And again, how do we measure it? How do we think about measuring it in our work? And I wanna start with a couple of stories in part because I'm an ethnographer by training. And also I think it'll give you a sense of how I got to the questions I am and how I started to kind of pursue answering them. Um, not all of my research is about schools, but that's what I'm gonna um, focus on today. And, and actually I'm gonna start with an experience um, that I had when I was um, studying to become an elementary school teacher, which is how I started out. Um, and I particularly uh, signed up for a program that would give me five different student teaching placements because I wanted to be a good teacher and I knew if I was going to be any good at it, I would need lots of practice screwing it up first. Um, so I got into different schools and I was seeing a whole series of, um, in some ways, just kind of racial injustices in action that really uh, eventually kind of pushed me out of teaching at least at that level and into a PhD program. And I just want to tell one of those stories. And it was about a little boy named Moses. Um, so I was in one of these student teaching placements at um, a, a very successful school and a diverse school district. And um, I was with, this was, I had been told ahead of time, this was one of my good placements because it was a really good teacher. And I was talking to the teacher and principal um, a couple of weeks into this placement. Um, I guess you need to know for the story that there are, or this, the classroom I was in was half black and half white and smallish. So there were about five African American boys in this class and they couldn't have been more different. Tall, short, loud, quiet. Um, there's this kid Moses who I fall in love with who was so quiet. He just spent all of his recesses reading a book. You know, he had the cutest little round glasses. Anyway. So I was talking to the principal and the teacher and I said, you know, can you tell me a little bit, you know, as a new teacher, like, who should I look out for? There's, you know, I wanted to get at the lay of the land. And the principal said, you know, that she was really happy referrals had been down so far that year. And I said, oh, who from the class, you know, anyway, so without, this is a story would be familiar to all of us without even blinking. They said, they told the story of success of referrals being down and named all and only the African-American boys in the class as the kids who've gotten referred so far this year. And all I could think about was like, what could Moses possibly have done to get in trouble? You know, maybe he was reading when he was supposed to be doing something else, I don't know. But as, as these different placements unfolded, I kept writing in my weekly journals about um, how race seemed to be causing teachers to betray their intentions and values, how it seemed to cause people to not see, to miss see, how fundamentally the conditions of teaching and learning seem to shift dramatically across these different placements and schools and about how we were organizing school systems in ways that kids in um, schools just a few miles from each other were having fundamentally different educational opportunities. Um, and so I started my journey into research with just a lot of questions about having watched race and racism kind of unfolding in action and it led me to ask a, a series of questions. Some things like if, if race is a social construction as our, our re research says, what does that look like? And what role are schools playing in that? Um, how do we make sense of the fact that we have many of the same patterns of racial inequality as we did 40 or 50 years ago, but the mechanisms producing those inequalities have changed and, and um, so I'm gonna get into some of the data, but I wanna share one more story that sort of gets to what Jenny was talking about a little bit because this story happened the first week I went to this new PhD program. You know, I'm, I'm leaving out all the time in between. I entered this new PhD program with all of these sincere questions, all this energy, all this uh, 
And um, the first person I met with was a very prominent um, uh, educational researcher. I won't mention their name. Um, and she knew I wanted to study race and she knew I wanted to be ethnographer. She was kind of trying to talk me out of that, but she was, you know, um, she said, she was telling me about, she'd just done this class, the statistics class, and they'd been doing this analysis, focusing on science scores, science outcomes. Um, and she said, you know, we controlled for everything. And in the end, race was still significant. And then she kind of shrugged at me. And I thought, you know, I, there were a lot of things in that shrug. And I thought, what, what does she think she's telling me? And it, it, it was a moment in which I realized in a new way that the very challenges I was seeing about race and racism and all the ways it got in the way were as true in the research enterprise as they had been in schools. Um, that the challenges of what I often, you know, what we might label as white supremacy are present not just in schools, but in the kind of scholarship and, and in debates about how race and racism matter. And so, and all of those things have been, have been played out in various ways um, that I'm happy to think about with everybody and engage with later. So anyway, so um, one of the big things I've grappled with thinking about race and racism and studying it, and this is a um, kind of a concept that I um, started using seriously um, in my first book and my first major dive into these issues in race in the schoolyard, where I wanted to think about um, the ways that um, schools played a part in this ongoing process of race making. Um, this is a quote from Louis Lacan, but it also draws on a concept that E.P. Thompson talked about decades ago with regard to plantations. The idea that schools are not simply processing an ethno-racial division that would somehow exist outside of and independently from them, but are part of the process of producing them or co-producing them um, out of inherited demarcations and disparities of group power. So what does that look like for me? So part of me is that we need to think about race as something that's ongoing, right? So schools are one of many places, not the only place that actually creates racial subjects. Children don't arrive at school already black, white, or Latinx or Asian, but become those things at least in part in the context of schools. Um, as Matthew Desmond and Briar offered, you know, we don't come into this world as African or, or, or European or Asian, the world comes into us and kids are learning these things from a young age. And I'll give you a couple of examples of what this looks like. Um, so one was from some fourth graders sitting on the schoolyard um, as part of a class presentation that morning. Um, Lily had described her ethnic heritage as Mexican American and European American. And she was asking this kid, Kate, who was staying next to her about her own background. And she said, oh, I'm just Caucasian. And then there was Benjamin nearby, a biracial, bicultural kid in their class who was Colombian and Filipino. Um, and they asked him, what are you? And he looked at them for several moments without saying anything and said, he'd rather not say. And trying to be helpful, Lily said, you're Chinese, right? And then he didn't respond and the girls, turn off, but these kind of dynamics are happening all the time in schools where kids are learning about how others see them. They're trying to make sense of the kids they see. Um, I'll give you one other example um, in from a exercise where some children had to write an essay about what Martin Luther King meant to them. Um, and DeAndre wrote an essay outside about how he was so grateful to King for allowing him to have friends, white friends like Jose. And Jose leapt out of his seat saying, I know you ain't talking about me, I ain't white, right? So like really struggling over the kind of boundaries about what it means, about how they're being seen, how others are seeing them. And obviously also schools are also implicitly and explicitly teaching racial lessons all the times. So they are making race in other ways. Um, it's about all the ways that kids are seeing and learning and paying attention to who gets on what bus at the end of the day, who's getting disciplined and who's not noticing patterns of occupational segmentation within schools, who has which kinds of jobs, seeing all these positional inequalities and working hard to figure out what they mean. Um, I recently actually walked through a school that had this beautiful display of dioramas about Native American tribes. And of course, this is in some ways a much more careful and at least partially historically accurate version than what we produced in elementary, what I produced in elementary school long in the old, long time ago, but it still carried a message of these as, as noble long ago peoples who aren't actually still part of our communities on a daily basis. So all kinds of lessons that we're learning all the time. Um, 
the debates going on right now about critical race theory, as we all know, nobody in kindergarten is teaching critical race theory, but this battle is very much about, are we going to teach complex and accurate histories of this country we live in or not, right? And all that is about, about these kinds of debates. Um, schools are also made by race. And by that, I mean, our long history of education, which has been central to the building of racial hierarchies, been central as a key strategy of racial terror and control, controlling access to literacy, not just in the South, but in the Southwest, on plantations in Hawaii, et cetera. As Carter G. Woodson it's been a, kind of said, it's sort of a fundamental premise that if you control a man's thinking, you don't need to control his actions, right? So schools and access to education has always been a part of that and is still very much in some ways that racial dynamics are shaping schools today, how we organize school systems, how we fight over district boundaries, how court states are engaged in these struggles about what it means to guarantee education. Um, we see it locally in all kinds of ways, how we decide about whether to keep schools open or close. In Chicago, um, a few years ago, CPS closed dozens of schools affecting primarily black students. And they said it wasn't about race, but about demographics. And without even a hiccup, um, engaged in this great act of historical amnesia about what had in fact gone into the demographic change they were talking about in terms of the tearing down of public housing and all the kinds of things that had led to the kind of changes they were talking about. Um, and obviously um, also shaping how people select schools, um, how the people decide which kind of school is appropriate for their child, all those kinds of things. Um, another great example from Illinois, just share briefly, Illinois offers an interesting example. It's where I'm at. It's also a great example of how much race shapes even like funding of schools. Up until recently, Illinois um, was one of the most inequitable in the country. Um, it is relies much more on local property taxes. Your, your access to good education in the state is very much shaped by the wealth of the community you're in. And the state passed a new law um, four years ago on evidence-based funding, this is a, which created these adequacy targets. I won't get into all the details, it's not that important. But it was, if you look at this table, you can see um, that when you look across the state, even after the state has implemented this law and tried to close these gaps, um, the supposedly, excuse me, uh, uh, race neutral way that the state has been funding schools has had really differential impacts on kids throughout the, the, the state in terms of thinking about districts and that sort of thing. Okay. So back to like, why do I think it's so important to think about race and racism as, as a kind of process? Um, as something that's ongoing. Um, and part of it for me is about thinking about this little line that we imagine a lot when we're thinking about race and educational outcomes. And this focus on schools as race-making institutions for me emphasizes that it's not just old news, but it's that we need to really be thinking about the kind of current mechanisms and processes and policies and practices because it also helps us give us leverage to think about how schools and institutions and organizations might function differently. So just as a quick, you know, two minute summary of another large project, when my colleague John Diamond and I um, wrote, despite the best intentions, um, how racial inequality thrives in good schools a few years ago, it sort of started by looking at some of this kind of data and asking like, why, why is race still correlated with achievement? Why does the whiteness, why do we so easily use whiteness of white students or the blackness of black students to predict math scores? Um, and in fact, when we went into the school, we ended up studying in Riverview for the first time. I know I'm not giving much context for the book, but I'm happy to talk more about it. Um, we saw what you see in a lot of schools like this, which is a very diverse school in which classrooms were very segregated. That's kind of second generation segregation we often see in schools. Um, and again, this question of like, this is why do we have this kind of racially stratified academic hierarchy within schools? That's Carl O'Connor's language. Um, and how do we begin to think about the different mechanisms that make that happen today? And what were the kind of local logics that help us understand? Um, and that's what I wanted to, it kind of gets us back a little bit to that um, story I told at the beginning about that shrug I got from, from a, a new faculty member when I went to graduate school, because historically, this is often what, when people measure race in their research, when we think about how it might matter, there's a whole bunch of stuff that 
that uh, doesn't get articulated and ends up being a placeholder for these kinds of things? Is it about culture somehow? Is it about attitudes about schooling? Is it about family values? Um, and we could talk about all the research related to this. I once wrote an article about the oppositional culture hypothesis that was called the nine lives of the oppositional culture hypothesis because I couldn't believe that it was still alive in, in so many ways. Um, and so in many of these things persist. When we interviewed white families at the school about why there were so many racialized uh, hierarchies still in the building, uh, all of, you know, it was, again, not surprising to hear these white, but very liberal families say over and over again, uh, talk about um, uh, narratives about family values and who valued education and so all this stuff very much with us, but how important it is conceptually and theoretically to recognize, to, to kind of reformulate, to rethink what, what is really going on here. And for me, this means both thinking about race, as I said, is something that's ongoing, right? It's not as a social fact, but something that racial hierarchies are producing that are ongoing and all of the ways it matters simultaneously, the macro in the micro, the micro in the macro, um, and all of it within this larger history and context. So if we think about how much race shapes access to material resources, wealth gaps in this country, et cetera, um, we can think about all the ways um, that race shapes, uh, what kind of social networks we are embedded in. Sometimes I've thought about my work in, as sort of naming the obvious, um, trying to describe these kind of processes and mechanisms so we can see what um, historian Thomas Holt named as the levels problem. Um, he said, it's the level of the everydayness of race that race is reproduced via the marking of the other and that racist ideas and practices are naturalized and made self-evident and then somehow beyond challenge. Because for me, part of what's so powerful about race is it both produces all kinds of inequalities and then becomes the, the explanation for them at the same time, um, the, the reason that we're comfortable with them. Um, and so thinking about how do we interrupt that? How do we name it? Um, how do we get to the point where we're uncomfortable with the fact that all kids break, are breaking rules, but only some kids are getting punished for it? Um, that we have built into our curriculum assumptions that kids are going to know things that we don't teach them. Um, that parents who have connections um, and have knowledge translate into academic, to advantage educational experiences for their kids in schools, um, all those kinds of things. So how do we keep that going? And for me, it's not just an intellectual endeavor, but um, very much a kind of normative endeavor. It's not just about trying to understand <clears throat> kind of in full and complex ways how race shapes outcomes, but about actually trying to interrupt that link. Um, I was thinking a lot about, talked, mentioned him at the beginning, philosopher Charles Mills, who I um, had learned a lot from, he passed away recently. And he talked about this pursuit of understanding race and particularly thinking about uh, white ignorance and kind of how it much our epistemology is so social, right? So how, how we approach these questions is about our position in the world and, um, and how much our work is to interrupt that, not just to understand it, but to try to do something. Um, and so just to wrap up, um, a couple of things that I wanted to um, say, and I know I'm about a minute, I have about a minute left. Um, for me, this is just, again, to put on the table essentially, like how, our, how much our racial thinking matters, how much our conceptualization of race matters in terms of how we approach the research endeavor, and even just what kind of questions we ask in the first place. Um, how essentially, you know, we're getting pushed a lot by scholars. Um, my colleague Carolyn Tyson and I wrote recently about what it means to kind of flip some of the historic assumptions. A lot of times, sort of like we're in, I, this has been true in the courts, but it's often been true in the research endeavor that if you want to talk about racism or discrimination happening, you have to have evidence for it. You have to be able to prove that racism is happening. When in fact, if we look at history, there has been no point in the history that United States in which we've, we've offered kids anywhere near equal educational experiences. So in some ways, it makes much more sense to start with the premise, there is racism, that discrimination is happening. And then the, the onus should in some ways be, you have to prove otherwise, right? So how do we begin to really recognize our institutions, our organizations are not race neutral, that that's not the starting place, but in fact, quite the opposite. Um, and that if race still in any ways matters, if, if we're seeing racial disparities, if we're seeing race shaping school outcomes, 
that that's all about a process of, of social doing and, a, and in many ways uh, about institutional failure. And, um, and therefore the onus is on us to kind of break that link and, and, and make, it, make it be different. How's that? Um, I'll end it there and I look forward to, uh, to the next talks and engaging more, thanks. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Amanda. That was really great. And I'm going to pick up on many of the things that you just said, particularly um, this idea of race as a process and schools as race making sites, um, and also um, continue the focus on Illinois here. So today I'm going to look specifically at a project with my colleagues, uh, Shazia Miller and Rachel Feldman, where we're looking at race. Um, and racism in higher education institutions. So we call this using a facilitated collaborative to build racial equity in higher education institutions. And similarly, um, we're thinking about studying racism as embedded in higher education organizations and shifting the frame to thinking about um, young people or students as coming in uh, with their race is what is driving what is happening, but instead looking at where power resides, which is in the, uh, the institutions themselves, in the organizations, and ways we can shift what's happening there to really make uh, the biggest changes. So again, uh, this is very in line with what Amanda just proposed. So in our organizational study to of race and racism in higher education, we're thinking about um, these institutions is having long racial histories, right? So many of them, um, like my own institution, um, have histories they can uh, trace back to slavery and the ways that um, they have profited off of this. Um, and these histories do not just go away now that we're looking at uh, specific problems of today. How institutions of higher education are involved in sorting and tracking along racial lines, both in the student bodies and in the staff and the faculty um, that work there. And often this idea in higher education that all the issues that happen are the result of other institutions, of the K-12 system, the ways that uh, racism has played out there and has created inequalities. That's what is creating the inequalities that we see in higher education. Or what is happening in the labor market or in the housing market, um, that segregation is what we see here. But institutions of, of higher education are both involved in that institutionalizing of racial categories or making racial subjects, but also in creating it. Um, I, I like to think of this um, category of the URM or underrepresented minority. That's a very higher education specific category. It shifts from um, institution to institution, but it's something that carries meaning and rewards to it and um, punishments as well. Um, that is something that is specific to uh, this kind of organization. And then um, of course the formal and hidden curriculum. I am involved in the formal curriculum of teaching classes on uh, race and racism uh, for students. This is often a place too where they are exploring their own uh, racial identities that may shift over the course of their time in college. And then the ways that we teach them in all the other parts of the school about what it means to be racial su subjects and how uh, that should matter for them. We know that it matters for hiring and admissions and also um, schools themselves are particularly in this more moment really using it as a way to market and promote themselves as racially diverse as places uh, that we should embrace uh, what is happening there. And so by looking from this organizational approach, we stop asking questions about what can we do to get students up to par so that they're ready for college and instead how can the organizations themselves shift to be places that are more equitable, safer spaces that do better by their students. I'm gonna look at this specifically um, in the context of Illinois um, in the ILEA study um, that uh, we are conducting. And so uh, the study is of the Illinois Equity and Attainment Initiative. Um, it 
brings together 26 colleges and universities in Illinois who are publicly committed to reduce their completion um, gaps between uh, white students and Black and Latinx students and between Pell recipient students and non-Pell recipient students. It is a uh, unique collaborative as it brings together two and four year institutions in the same state context. And then um, it is facilitated by the Partnership for College Completion, which is a nonprofit that um, brought all the colleges together, um, supports them and helping them to create equity plans, to implement their equity plans and to work towards this goal of uh, reducing completion gaps. As part of the collaborative, the schools have agreed to make equity plans, make them public, make sure that it's uh, people who are high up in the university who are taking part, um, to have benchmarks and uh, disaggregate their data so that um, it can be seen how they're meeting these benchmarks and then to participate together so that they can learn from one another and from um, the Partnership for College Completion. So looking at this, we really draw from the work of Victor Ray in um, the theory of racial organizations to think through what would it take for these colleges and universities to shift what they're doing um, to help to close these completion gaps? We start with thinking about three levels that he lays out, ideological, structural, and the schematic. We believe that all of these uh, three need to be aligned. So um, the ideologies of the colleges need to match what's happening at the level of individuals in it, their, in, their implicit maps and schemas, and there need to be resources and uh, re uh, routines in place to make this happen. When there is alignment, and that alignment is towards being racially explicit, uh, to being equity-minded, uh, to being asset-based rather than deficit-based, uh, we think this is going to uh, create good outcomes for students and that this can happen through the participation of uh, PCC, where they coach um, members, faculty, and administrators at colleges and universities. They help the, them craft equity plans, um, they host webinars, and then they uh, create physical spaces or virtual spaces in this moment for colleges and universities to come together to learn from one another. And then at the level of the colleges and universities, they create an equity plan, they enact it, they measure it to see how it's going, and then they see what's happening and make changes and, and uh, do cycles of this inquiry and implementation. When all that happens, then we think this is going to improve uh, the graduation outcomes for Black and Latinx students. So we ask um, how are colleges and universities building racially equitable practices? at their institutions, and um, specifically, how are their equity plans aligning with what we know um, are the best uh, kind of the best practices for equity plans? Um, how are they directing their resources? And are they earmarking them specifically for Black and not Latinx students? Or are these kind of a general earmark um, resources? Um, how are they applying routines in the service of racial equity? And how are these embedded in the institution that will last long be, uh, after the interim uh, provost leaves uh, the university? And then at the level of the individual, how are uh, individuals implementing the equity plan in relation to their, their schemas? We're also curious about this kind of as it moves from college and university from one another, are they beginning to mimic each other, um, become more like one another, um, learn from each other? And is this resulting in uh, good, good outcomes for everyone. So, and we look at this uh, superstructure of the racial ideologies, and we're really focusing in on college and university presidents and their outward folk, uh, facing um, kind of policies and PCC beliefs. Um, we're looking at the routines. Uh, if you have a curriculum, um, uh, mandate for all the, uh, the professors, what are the steps that each have to go through uh, to make that happen? Um, and where is the money flowing? And then at these implicit racial maps. So I'm gonna hone in a little bit on some of the specific ways um, that we're doing this, and then talk about some of the challenges that we're facing in this work. So first, um, we are 
using largely qualitative methods, um, interviews with college and university leaders, um, looking at these equity plans and the strategic plans of the universities um, and the ways that uh, the Partnership for, for College Completion has created guides for this to happen. And then we're looking um, at what happens in key meetings, um, what happens at these equity summits, what are the ways that people are arranging for this to happen and or what are the steps they're taking, um, looking specifically at their budgets, their job descriptions, um, core curriculum guides, et cetera. And then finally, talking to individuals about um, their schemas and observing them in action. So right now we are engaged in the first phase of the study, which is equity plan analysis. Um, looking at the programs and policies and what they contained and how they are like uh, cross institutionally. And um, kind of getting to the specific, we're looking at things that have been said to be really important. So we want to see this racial explicitness. Uh, do they shy away from racial language or are they really laying out who they're thinking about and why? And when they're laying it out, are they using deficit language? to talk about uh, students, or are they uh, using asset language, um, looking at uh, faculty and administrators as who needs to shift rather than the students? Are they targeting Black and Latinx students? So um, we found this a lot where um, a problem can be laid out as one that is specific to say uh, Black students, but a policy is more generally focused for all students. So it will be a first year experience policy. So what are the ways that they're actually targeting plans and resources to where they see um, the issue happening? How does this connect with other intersectional um, accesses? Um, how committed are these plans overall to racial equity, equality? Um, and are they measurable, uh, clearly articulated, and align across their other uh, places in the institution. We're now moving into our focus study for six case study schools, a mix of two and four year schools, looking at equity plan implementation in these uh, institutions. So we picked uh, three four year schools and three two year schools um, that have a mix of student populations that are majority white or majority Latinx or majority Black, and then schools that have both really uh, done a lot of engagement with ILEA, gone to a lot of the meetings, really interacted a lot uh, with the Partnership for College Completion, and then those who have been less engaged who have signed up but haven't been uh, actively going to things. We will interview presidents at the schools, um, members of the equity team, people who are on the ground running programs, and then trying to look at spread people who have not signed up for these initiatives at all, but who uh, work at the institution. And we're uh, in our first one, looking at these ideologies and the plans that they have in place. We're gonna trace them in our second one to the routines that they have and um, use some elicitation techniques to get at schemas. And then finally, uh, measure the resource uh, acquisition in our third interviews. All right, so what are some of the challenges in actually uh, doing this on the ground uh, that we are facing? So first is uh, thinking about building equity into our research team. So we've really tried to be mindful in having people who are part of the team who are close to what we are studying. So that means uh, trying to have people who uh, have gone through the two-year system and the four-year system, um, having people who are PAL recipients and non-PAL recipients, having people who are actively in college right now, um, as well as people uh, from racial backgrounds that mirror uh, what we are looking for. And that has created really um, one huge benefit, which is this analytic leverage that we have. Um, we ha are getting insights that we would miss without this collection of the team. Um, for instance, we just had an observation um, at a meeting and one of our team members 
uh, was involved at the community college level in building um, equity plans in California. And so she just uh, kind of saw through all the things that the administrators were, were saying in a way that would have just glossed over uh, to people who didn't have that experience. But it has also meant that we have a lot of people who have not been traditionally involved in data collection. Um, so who have not done a ton of interviews and observations, and that has created um, a need to have training at a higher level than if you bring in a bunch of people who are researchers, have these long histories um, in the field. And then this, the other um, issues we're related to also goes back to kind of what Amanda put forward, which is race as a process. Um, but having to attend to it often in static encounters. Um, so one is um, kind of related to this ongoing uh, pandemic, which is, but also larger than that as well. So we are looking at places where people have explicitly said that they care about um, racism or uh, stopping racism and attending to race. But how do we get to see what's going on below the surface? Uh, this is very hard and particularly challenging in the virtual space where uh, what we're seeing is really mediated by what is on the screen before us. So you can imagine that it's not like it just becomes easy when you're in person, but you have more of that downtime. Uh, you get to be in places that they haven't directed your eye where um, on camera, you only see what is in the box before you. Um, the second is uh, capturing racial identity and dynamics in virtual observations when people have not self-identified. Um, so we uh, are currently um, applying our own racial labels to them and um, making sure that we say that it is our own um, and labeling that. But how do you deal with those kind of dynamics um, in a virtual or even in person space? And then um, when is the best time to ask participants to identify their race? Um, is this something we want them primed with? Um, after we talk to them, it's something that we clearly care about, but what is the best uh, chance to do this? And then last, um, I will end with some ideas for moving forward to attending race in research design. Um, the first is, really to draw from race scholars. Uh, I think this was a point that, the last point that Amanda made as well, that there is lots of evidence that racism exists. There's a long um, empirical record of it, um, of the causes and consequences, particularly in institutions. Um, you don't need to go looking for racism. It's there, um, the scholarship exists. And to use that as your basis, to start rather than to try to prove uh, whether racism is occurring um, in the place that you have a question. The second is to check and recheck your research questions and conceptual models for deficit perspectives. This is something that uh, we uh, ourselves had to change along the way and got really great feedback in doing this. Um, just uh, continually remembering that it's racism, not race that's driving inequality and that many of our questions that we've started uh, when we're thinking about problems, particularly like a problem like the achievement gap, it can so easily fall into um, thinking about what can we do for students rather than thinking about institutions or organizations. And then finally is to um, build your analytic capacity through these diverse research teams, which we are just really um, enjoying uh, um, and having a lot of um, advantages coming out of the model. Um, and I will end there. Thank you so much, Amanda and Johanna, for those incredibly thoughtful and provocative presentations. I think that our URE researchers um, on this webinar will take a lot of lessons from the work that you've conducted. So we're gonna turn at this point to researchers who do study the use of research evidence to hear about how they are incorporating attention to race and racism in their work. First, we'll hear from June Ahn, Associate Professor of Learning Sciences and Research Practice Partnerships at the University of California, Irvine. June is in the early stages of a foundation funded project that examines how research practice partnerships foster research use and anti-racist work in education. 
Then we'll turn to Meredith Honig, Professor of Education Policy, Organizations and Leadership, and Director of the District Leadership Design Lab at the University of Washington, whose foundation-supported study examines research as a resource for driving systemic change for educational equity in school district offices. Though her original proposal did not include critical race theory, her team's progressively more explicit anti-racist approach has led them to learn more about and draw on tenets from critical race theory. We thought it would be informative to feature scholars who study evidence use, who are at the earlier stages of, or relatively new to, thinking about how to conceptualize and attend to race and racism in their studies, because we're hoping more researchers will take up the lens of critical race theory and other theoretical frameworks in studying improving the use of evidence use. After we hear from, from June and Meredith, I'll facilitate a short discussion among our panelists and then open things up for um, conversation with the entire audience. Please continue to place your questions and thoughts in the chat as we proceed. June? Great, um, I'm going to share my screen. And just a quick check that you see the slides and not all of my notes and all the background stuff. Um, but uh, thanks everybody, uh, really thankful for the invitation to speak here. Um, and uh, before I begin, I just wanted to acknowledge that although I'm speaking uh, for our research team, uh, everything I'm talking about has been kind of a collaborative process of sense making and intellectual work uh, by our my collaborators, Dr. Kim Gomez, and our research team, Dr. Ung Seng Lee and Chris Wegmer. And so I also invite you to contact them as well if you have follow-up questions or um, you know, conversations you want to have. I think uh, they'll also be great representatives of the work. Um, so I'm gonna speak a little bit about our uh, recent uh, project that we began that, um, funded by the WT Grant Foundation. Um, we are a network of research practice partnerships across Southern California. And uh, we are, uh, the RPPs are also working with our two institutions. That's been kind of an organizing structure here across UC Irvine and UCLA. Um, and we are starting from the RPP world, but focusing explicitly on how we can infuse research use or strategies of research use for specific anti-racist change efforts in our local school partners. Um, and we just got started in September 21. And I say that because um, in RPP work, we spend a lot of time on the relationship development, on the mutual negotiation of the research agenda. And so we're really in the throes of that right now. And so I'll spe be speaking a lot about the issues that our research team is grappling with in terms of uh, how does race play a role in, in these kind of methodological uh, processes of RPPs. Um, and so just to give a call out to Dr. Uh, Quinn, just what's going on under the, the layer of the structure, right, um, in, in the internal teams. Um, so the RPPs that we're focusing on um, explicitly are uh, working on anti-racist, uh, different anti-racist goals uh, within their schools. Um, we are interested in how we position partnership work within the school uh, to lead to change efforts um, be, uh, beyond the kind of internal sense making that and learning that we're doing. Um, and Dr. Gomez and I both come from the learning sciences as a discipline. And so we have a joint commitment to co-design and co-design methodologies uh, to create solutions collaboratively with our school partners. And so that flavor you'll kind of see um, is infused in some of the questions we're grappling with here as well. Um, just to give you a sense of what the project structure looks like, so as we're developing RPP groups, the RPPs are actually subgroups within schools. So within a school organization, you might have a group of teachers who are trying to develop the eth an ethnic studies curriculum, and that's a problem of practice that they're working on. Or in, a, in another school, it's uh, the assistant principals are really concerned about the academic success of particular racial minority groups or in another school, uh, the principal and uh, department chairs uh, across uh, disciplines might be uh, really worried about the variability in the parent response to racially aware and racially just school programs that they're trying to enact, you know, and dealing with the pushback or the protests or the feedback and things. So we are um, starting out in an RPP format, working from the problems of practice of different groups within, within our school partners and trying to figure out how do we um, set the conditions to bring research into that process and, and, and amplify that process. Um, I've been learning so much from just every all of y'all in the, uh, the panel here, and it's gotten me to think about like how to situate where we are in the design space, uh, since we're kind of co-design world. Uh, what's the design space of um, 
uh, solutions or strategies that we're all trying to enact. And here's my like sacrificial offering for how I'm thinking about it. It's like, we see systemic policy changes happening. So for example, in California, there's a statewide ethnic studies requirement to graduate high school, right? Or um, in a university, in my university, you might see a, a whole university campus-wide program, a diversity training or, a, um, uh, or different policies and programs. Um, and I, where we are is actually from the inductive bottom up, which may be the small subgroups within the organization that are uh, making change efforts happen, the reading groups that people are organizing, or the, uh, the small group of faculty who are really pushing on a particular issue, or the student group that's pushing on a particular issue. Um, and this is often the invisible work that we might not document in our research. Um, so we're kind of in that space. Um, and uh, trying to understand if you build partnerships uh, there uh, with researchers, uh, what are the conditions under which we can do that work, right? Um, we've also been challenged uh, by our colleagues and advisors and, and reviewers to really be very precise about what kind of change we think we might push on or how different RPP groups may be positioned to push on something. And so we've been playing around with this framework here. Um, Dr. Gomez, my collaborator was talking about uh, well, we might conceptualize this as do we change perceptions? Are we changing the way people talk uh, within our with our groups or are we changing action moves that people make, right? And so we've been really plan trying to get more precise about how we see that in our case studies. How do we document that and measure that in our case studies? Um, and just a key conjecture that's come out from that is that uh, we are uh, working from the framework of um, change happens in our interactions with each other doing the work in the RPP, so in the meeting, when we're making a decision. Um, but also uh, one limitation in, of our positionality working with small subgroups is that we often have a limited locus of control or influence depending on which group you're in, right, within an organization. And so we butt up against the institutionalized policies and practices of the place. And so we're kind of um, grappling with that tension there a little bit. Um, and so, you know, one way to think about this is um, I, it's often easy for me personally to see the action moves of a policy or an action moves of a program because that's the instantiation of a long history of people working together to create that move, right? Um, whereas we have the opposite challenge of, uh, we'll have a lot of process data across all these comparative research practice partnership groups about what we're talking about and what we're saying and doing. Uh, but then uh, how that relates to the uh, uh, broader kind of action move is going to be um, something that we're uh, really attuned to. Um, <clears throat> so just to given that background, what I want to do in the second half of this talk is just talk about uh, particular research practice partnership discussions, uh, methodological discussions of what you do in a research practice partnership. And we are really wanting to push on how do we put race at the forefront of our decisions there. Right. And so how do how can race consciousness, how can anti-racist frameworks inform our design decisions when we're doing RPP? Right. And um, since we just began, we're really in that structuring phase, the developing phase. So I'll just give a couple of kind of uh, sacrificial things we're thinking about uh, to foster conversation and questions. Um, so one thing in the beginning, when you're structuring a partnership, uh, it's a conscious decision of a small group of people who are going to decide to work together. Um, and we've been really attending carefully to uh, what are the, um, who are the people coming to the table, including ourselves, so myself and my racial history, my kind of, you know, background, Dr. Gomez, like our research team, but also our partners, and uh, we're spending a lot of time thinking both for the relationship development side, we need, we're attending to that with all of our groups, but also from a methodological perspective, these are informing our kind of the bounds of our comparative cases. And so we're really interested in reflexively studying the conditions under which our, our groups form and how that relates to ultimately what we do uh, later on. Another thing we're doing is in RPP work, you spend a lot of time getting to know each other and because it helps you define your joint project together. Um, and so we've been adding on to that to not only talk about our expertise and our skills and what we're interested in, but actually uh, trying to figure out ways to talk about our racialized personal histories, you know, like, who am I? Like, you know, as a 
Korean American person who grew up in Rhode Island or, you know, like, what does that mean? And how does that affect like what I say in meetings and stuff like that, or how I conceptualize a project. Um, and I would say like, this is a non-trivial beneath the layer thing, right? Which is like, how do you create the conditions in a partnership team to talk about these things? And how do we uh, infuse that directly into the projects we create together and the research we create together? So um, no answers here, no like no deep insights for me is just that we're trying things out and um, part of the work we're gonna do in this project is um, document what that looks like. Um, another thing in this beginning phase is uh, in a partnership, you define roles, you know, uh, and, and the research use, because our focus is on research use, uh, we're really interested in, um, okay, like what roles do researchers play? What roles do our partners play? But deciding who gets to do that can be some kind of invisible, right? And a lot of kind of biases in our histories play into that. And so we're trying to also think about how do we be uh, continually reflexive about who, who decides to do what and, and um, how do we share that power and authority? So I was invited to give this talk today, but I will probably not give this talk in the future. I would probably ask somebody else to give this talk in the future, right? And so just, uh, just decisions like that actually helped um, influence the RPP. We're also right now focusing on developing joint research agendas. So building from those problems of practice, a key issue is like, how do you, um, a key role that researchers can play is like, framing these uh, problems of practice into the broader kind of research evergreen uh, issues that are happening, right? And so, for example, one of our partners um, is really interested in supporting students in their AP classes, uh, particularly minoritized students. What is that a case of? And so the more we talk to them about it, it's really become a case of fostering kind of identity, right? What does it mean to foster student identity in an AP stats class, right? to go beyond just questions of like, you know, how do we get everybody to score a three or higher or something like that, right? Uh, something like teachers working together for curricular change, right? The practical project is the curriculum, but the evergreen issue is actually very complicated uh, change making efforts with teachers to all get on the same page around race and how that's infused into their pedagogy, right? And so that's kind of what we're doing right now is, um, you know, one role that our research team's playing is in that framing role a little bit. Um, lastly, uh, or not lastly, but in this phase, uh, we're also talking about how do we take um, every everyday evergreen problems of practice and make uh, race uh, a forefront in how we think and frame about that issue. Um, and we were really inspired by kind of past uh, calls in, in the past WT grant um, webinars um, and, think, and white papers and uh, think pieces about who's at the table, what kinds of questions get created, um, how do we decide to pursue a question together. Those decisions happen collaboratively, are co-designed collaboratively, um, and so we're trying to figure out um, how to uh, make sure that uh, our racialized experiences are forefront in that. Um, and so on the flip side, we haven't gotten to this point yet, but um, we're playing around with what research use means here and what role researchers play in bringing research to these conversations, right? So do we like present research? Do we write two page summaries of things? Uh, and I think one of the critical issues I wanna throw out to this community and I'd love uh, conversation and feedback on is, um, I'm thinking that uh, being more precise about transferability and learning how to apply frameworks to our particular small, smaller local issues, not smaller, but local issues. I think that might be like a key kind of tension point for us, we're trying to to figure out um, how to do that, uh, and particularly bringing uh, work about race uh, into our local problems. Um, and lastly, uh, something that I've really appreciated uh, in the really hard reviews uh, in the process of getting the grant, uh, the reviewers really challenged us to think about the positionality of the groups. And so we are really thinking about that. Like, so if you've got a small subgroup a reading group reading books about uh, race and they're trying to change the curriculum. What is the locus of control there? How do we um, make sure we're precise about what we're gonna change and how we're gonna change it? But also how we position our partners to do that change, right? And so um, because we're working inductively from the bottom up, I think that'll be a continued challenge. So I just kind of offer those, like uh, the, I think we are speaking more to the beneath the layer things and the processes and we'll be uh, self-documenting what these uh, different RPP groups do uh, over the next couple of years. And with that, um, I thanks for uh, the invite again and welcome any questions and conversation.
All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Meredith Honig, a professor at the University of Washington. And Lydia, Rainey, and I are in about the third year of a project that aims to address a persistent problem in education that's extremely well known, but not well addressed. That is that for at least decades, a common refrain among education reformers and researchers has been that educational inequities are systemic but our field generally has not focused on a key aspect of the system and systemic inequities. And that's the school district central office and how um, inequities are deeply rooted in the institutional fabric of those public bureaucracies and what to do about it. So our research program addresses that gap by focusing on this central research question how to realize fundamental systemic change in school di district central offices that advances educational equity. We use research on culturally responsive teaching to define educational equity as including school experiences that elevate, center, and value the culture, knowledge, and success of students identifying as Black, Indigenous, Latinx, of color or living in low income circumstances. How we center race and racism in our approach has evolved over time, um, as you heard, and I'll be sharing with you two main ways our project currently aims to do that. First, how we um, define the problem, um, and I'll be talking about how we do that. Uh, our problem definition assumes that realizing equity takes fundamental systemic change in central offices that takes an explicit anti-racist approach and that research and reform uh, typically has been focusing elsewhere. Um, our conceptual framework and research design aim to tackle that problem. We use expansive learning from cultural activity theory as a design approach that is really about fundamental systemic change. So it focuses on kind of the right target um, but it is race neutral, neutral. So we infuse our approach um, to expansive learning with tenants from critical race theory. So I'll take you through um, those two ideas. Um, first, in terms of the problem, as I've already suggested, uh, this research program builds on clear findings from equity studies that show how policymaking agencies perpetuate inequities. That's a general argument of critical race theorists like those named here. Um, there also has been a series of empirical studies more specifically addressing which functions of policymaking agencies are implicated. The list is long. I've just I've included some of the of the aspects of uh, policymaking agencies uh, that fit on the slide. These studies tend not to name central offices, but they talk about accountability policy, they talk about curriculum, they talk about um, teacher and leader training. And if you know what central offices do, then you know that um, all of these functions are the work of your local neighborhood school district central office. So what this list adds up to is that central offices are main perpetuators of educational um, inequities. We also take from this research that inequities within central offices are fundamental and systemic. In Dr. Khalifa's words, a pervasive fact of life that goes beyond the actions of individual actors to permeate multiple parts of the organization. That is, um, inequities show up in policies and programs like those listed on the other slide and also in individual behaviors, but their roots are institutional or at the fundamental level of the premises that underlie school districts regarding things like who schools should really serve, whose knowledge counts, and how to define achievement and success. Premises, which we uh, know on this webinar, have historically centered and advanced whiteness as the norm and standard. That um, distinction also passes our daily reality test. We work with school districts and school district leaders across the country and we find uh, central offices full of equity-minded people, including leaders of color, trying to do the right work, 
but stuck in an institution whose values and longstanding ways of working get in the way. So inequities are, are fundamental. They're also systemic, um, like Khalifa says, in that they're spread across central office functions, which over time have become so entwined with one another that efforts to change one gets stuck without coordinated aligned changes across the other interdependent parts. So we approach um, central offices assuming that the change necessary is fundamental and systemic. And we define that as shifts in the underlying premises on which central offices operate that have to be coordinated across the central office. Um, and uh, recent work in, <coughs> uh, in the field of educational equity makes really clear that as has this other uh, presentations on this panel, that the work has to proceed from an anti-racist stance for a number of reasons, including that race neutral approaches tend to actually mask racism and defeat equity efforts. Borrowing from critical race theory, we define that stance as one that takes an explicit, uh, a race explicit approach that assumes, doesn't seek to discover, but assumes the institutional embeddedness and ubiquity of racism and seek, actively seeks to decenter whiteness. From uh, the, listening to the superintendents we work with, uh, they're really plugged in to this problem and calling for a transformation of their central office and deep culture shifts. They say things like, our goal has to be nothing less than a total district transformation. We aim to retool the entire district to support equitable instruction and leadership in the buildings. And we have to be rooting out racism and laying down new roots. However, too many of the change strategies we see in central offices don't tackle the fundamental or systemic nature of, um, of racism. A lot of the reforms are what we consider additive and not fundamental. For example, there's a ton of resources right now for anti-bias training to shift individual behaviors that really don't get a kind of institutional embeddedness of, of racism in central offices. Uh, strategies like equity offices and officers do uh, nod to the institutional nature of racism, um, but they create these kind of separate, uh, often kind of marginalized, units in central offices that are somehow supposed to, to lead to fundamental systemic changes. And the, the early research on the experiences of those offices and officers um, confirms what we would worry about, which is that they have limited success. And uh, various design approaches um, do try to get at, um, uh, to tackle some problems with how inequities play out in central offices, but they have various limitations in that, again, they don't focus on fundamental systemic change. For example, a lot of these strategies ask central office staff to hone in on specific problems of practice, which over time results in this game of whack-a-mole where once you address one problem, another one crops up because those strategies are dealing with the symptoms of, um, racial inequities and not the fun, their fundamental systemic roots. And we love the research on um, community engaged design like, like June and others are doing. Um, but again, those two tend to focus on kind of discrete problems um, and not the underlying premises of central offices. So that's what we're trying to do with um, a, a research practice partnership we have with a local school district here, Highline Public Schools, focused on fundamental systemic change for equity, starting with not one trauma practice or even one central office unit, but multiple functions. Within teaching and learning, we're looking at teacher professional development, school improvement planning, and principal supervision in tandem with redesigning HR and data and accountability. Uh, Highline has been a strategic partner for many reasons, including their relentless commitment to this work by leaders across the central office. And as part, uh, partial evidence, there's a photo of me and the superintendent looking extremely relentless 
And in our uh, RPP, we've, as I mentioned, turned to, to cultural historical activity theories, ideas about expansive learning. We use that for our conceptual framework and also our design methodology and are adapting them um, to reflect a race explicit approach. Uh, this approach has been helping us focus on fundamental systemic change because that is what it does focus on. It's a design process that's about changing underlying premises across entire systems. It's also a process that helps people within systems reinvent their own work. <clears throat> There's an extremely important um, body of research in the US that uses expansive learning to engage community members in reform as a key equity strategy. And our research aims to complement those studies by emphasizing like original expansive learning studies do that central office staff themselves have to be central participants when the target is fundamental systemic central office change. Those staff have essential knowledge about redesign, but historically very little agency to use it. This work is extremely time consuming and it unfolds over time. Most of it gets done on the job. It's just not like, it's not a realistic project for intensive um, community engagement. And um, reform rhetoric in some circles sets up a false dichotomy between community and central office in many communities. <coughs> there are uh, many central office staff uh, especially in urban areas are women and they're people of color um, and really are community members. Um, so in engaging central office staff, we're really trying to address that dichotomy, especially in those systems where staff are women and people of color and leaders are, are uh, still traditionally white men. So our main participants in the expansive learning process are central office staff themselves. <clears throat> Our synthesis of expansive learning involves four stages that help staff develop what theory calls their transformative agency for leading expansive learning forward. And there's a lot to share here, so I'll just share a few highlights. <clears throat> um, first, expansive learning starts with what theory calls critical questioning to develop paralyzing agency. <clears throat> And our shorthand for this phase is antagonize, because basically we relentlessly confront the participating staff and leaders with a mismatch between the system they have and the one they need to realize racial equity so that they realize they can't go on with the system they have. And this first step is so important because in many public bureaucracies, staff are so used to not being able to affect broader change that they ultimately end up trying to do what they can within their role, but otherwise accept, accepting the status quo is just the way things are. So the status quo gets really normalized. <clears throat> as an example, the chief academic officer had identified school improvement planning as a key target for redesign. School improvement planning in school districts is very compliance oriented, not a true improvement planning process. And it was getting a in the way of improvements in teacher professional development and other things. So we worked with her to convene a design team of central office and school staff who first looked at some of our prior research that showed how the SIPs could drive equity, for example, by engaging school leaders and community members and developing a compelling school-wide vision <clears throat> that centers historically marginalized students and also providing support for teachers to grow in real realizing that vision. Then when they looked into data about how the SIP currently wor works in their district, they could really see the misalignment because the, the research we shared with them at the initial stage really expanded their imagination of what could be possible. And a key outcome at this phase was the chief academic officer decided not to adapt or tinker with the current SIP, but she shut it down. She said the SIP's beyond repair. And even though we don't have anything to replace it with, with yet, we're not doing it anymore, which, is like, which was a huge decision to make, especially given kind of the, the, the compliance-oriented nature of SIPs in many, many school districts. 
the middle phases of expansive learning, you know, also have a lot to them. What's important here is that they really focus staff on identifying <coughs> the premises that underlie their current systems and developing new premises before they jump to developing new approaches to their work. Um, this, th these middle phases become really important again, when if you remember that inequities uh, take root at the level of premises, so we have to understand what those are. And um, the rewriting of those premises is the first step before developing new ways of working, provide staff with an anchor for the new work as they design it moving forward. So they can be continuously checking themselves that they're on the right track. In the SIP example, a simple like root cause analysis that's in some other design processes would ask staff to think about, for example, what drives the current SIP? And staff would trace the SIP back to like federal and state requirements and focus them maybe on trying to change those things. Um, but in this view, those kind of organizational arrangements, those policy arrangements, are also symptoms, not root causes of the inequities. Um, so, at, and at this stage, we get to those root causes by focusing participants on questions that focus them on the premises, like what current assumptions does the SIP reflect about how school improvement processes can drive equity in schools? And through that kind of inquiry, we saw, uh, staff saw things like, oh, as currently designed, this, the SIP assumes schools will plan well to address racial inequities if they use the usual data, like standardized test scores, which reveals race-based achievement gaps. But what that's actually doing is, what those data use practices are actually doing is privileging the knowledge in those tests and also leads to negative overgeneralizations to groups and dehumanizing data practices, which just fans the flames of racism. Um, and through the kind of premise resetting process, they said, you know, let's focus our redesign of the SIP on, a, on new premises that take an explicit anti-racist approach, like schools improve when they know their students as individuals with multiple identities and many strengths that have to be leverage points for improvement, not their deficits. So, at, and after this process of premise setting, then uh, we engage uh, staff in figuring out literally what would the new SIP look like that reflects those premises. Um, and the process continues through ongoing implementation and improvement. And um, as, they, as they work between new models and the premises, they continuously ensure that their models reflect the new premises. And they also check their premises and make sure they're as powerful as they can be. You can do all of this and not center race and racism um, as key uh, drivers of educational inequities. Um, so we have used CRT to infuse our approach um, with, uh, with attention to some anti-racist practices. For example, and, uh, and in particular, we pay really careful attention to which research um, we are bringing into the process. In general, research has, has been an important catalyst for the different phases of expansive learning, and I can elaborate more on these at some point. Um, but they, uh, but just for example, the introduction of <clears throat> research that, that showed a new way of working with a SIP from an anti-racist approach really provoked um, staff's urgency and expanded their imagination. Uh, research like that by Eve Tuck on damage-centered data practices helped staff see that their data practices were riddled with, with racism. Um, which revealed some of their unseen premises. So which research we use um, integrate into the process has really mattered. Throughout the process, uh, we are 
working hard to center historically marginalized voices, both in terms of who's on the design team, really challenging central office staff to think about. It, we're in the very white Pacific Northwest. Still, can you? would it be possible to um, ensure that people of color are the majority on the design teams? Um, we also uh, are paying a lot of attention to our facilitation, um, uh, trying to engage in disruptive facilitation, continuously reflecting back to the group, for example, data about their own conversations and the extent to which they reflect um, racial bias. Um, and again, you know, trying to feed data back into the process that helps participants take a strengths-based approach to their efforts to to transform the central office in support of research for kids. Many challenges to this work, number one of which is just the work itself. I mean, we're engaged in fundamental systemic anti-racist change. It's, this is not easy work. Um, and so we, it might seem kind of basic to name it, but we are constantly reminding our partners that uh, unless the work feels hard and unless they feel the struggle, they're probably not doing they're probably not doing the work right or doing the right work. Um, this kind of work takes a laser-like sponsorship by central office leaders um, to keep going with the expansive learning processes, um, but that's hard um, because we're talking about central office staff who are running the systems they have while trying to create a new one. Um, there's a lot we can facilitate as outsiders who have some, some uh, free time uh, so to speak, but there's only so much we can facilitate because uh, this work has to be really driven from internally, from the inside. Sponsorship also holds special challenges, especially for female leaders of color who tell us over and over again, this is really risky work. Um, it's work we're not sure can be rewarded. We have worked hard to get into central office main leadership positions. Is this work gonna pay off? Um, is it worth the risk um, that you're asking us uh, to take and that we know we need to take, but still um, it's a risk. And then, you know, the facilitation of the expansive learning processes is really challenging. For example, we're grappling with how do you create a space for this work that truly decenters whiteness? Um, how do you avoid tokenism in uh, how, people participate and how you bring voices in. So these are ongoing um, challenges uh, that we would love uh, to engage you all in, in conversations about. So there's a lot to this, some of which I said and some of which um, I didn't. If you take nothing else away from, from what I did say, um, we hope that more people will focus on central office transformation as a main driver of racial equity as they do that to really pay careful attention to which design approaches they're using. Um, unless those design approaches really guide fundamental systemic change, they can actually get in the way of that kind of change. And that design approaches typically don't come um, with it from an anti-racist stance. So to borrow uh, Victor Ray's terms, it's important to racialize them. Thank you. Thank you all so much for these amazing presentations and for the time and, and thoughtfulness you took in, in putting these presentations together for our audience today. I want to start off a little bit um, before we turn to questions that audience members have uh, and facilitate a discussion among our panelists. This is kind of an unusual panel and that we've brought in two folks who I'm assuming are fairly unfamiliar with research on the use of research evidence and then two folks from the use of research evidence field. So I want to start by um, digging a little more into the nitty gritty of how to collect data on how race and racism show up in interactions and in organizational processes, because I think that will be really useful for a lot of our audience members. And I know that's come up in different ways in our presentations today. So first, let's start with you, Amanda and Johanna, as you're hearing these presentations from a field with, with which may be um, somewhat unfamiliar, although I know you, know you all work in the space of thinking about um, educational institutions. 
I wonder what stands out to you when you hear about June's and Merritt's studies. And, and if you have any thoughts about, you know, how as they proceed in thinking about um, systems change, as they proceed in thinking about research practice partnerships and anti-racist practices in schools, what kind of advice or insight do you have for them as they collect data, as they conduct interviews, as they undertake their analyses so that they can, they can continue to think in really deep and meaningful ways about race and the use of research evidence. Johanna, you want to go first? Do you want me to, want me to okay. jump? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I just want to say thanks. I, I, I am learning a ton and I think it's so interesting and I'm just going to continue the invitation to be provocative today. And just, I mean, I think what was so interesting about June's and Merritt's presentation is, is there's some ways there's some real tension there. I think there's like, bottom-up approach to this and a kind of very top-down approach to this mm -hmm. and both of them in some core ways really make sense and I think they also signal some challenges for each other and and I um and and again sort of getting back to this question of how racism works in a kind of big sense so like just one of the like one of the questions the whole time I was talking I wanted to know about like what are they doing about resistance because the print superintendents I know who tried to do some of this work have had organized campaigns to get them fired. And I, you know, and I think a little bit about this idea, you know, we are, we are always quoting Frederick Douglass, right? That power concedes nothing without a demand. And that sometimes, you know, and I and I and I say this to somebody who does some of this work, you know, and tries to help people think, you know, and then also sometimes wonders like, is this gonna work? You know, absent real organizing and, and movement building and you know, is, is there a technocratic solution to this or is this, you know, I mean, so anyway, that's just one thing. Um, and then, June, I just loved the questions you were asking about, like, what are we trying to change, right? Because there's all this work we do about in getting everybody on board, on relationship building, on getting people, you know, and then it's like, are we trying to change people's talk? Are we going to try to change what they're doing? And, it, it you know, all of them are such really good um, questions. Okay. It would be great to hear how you can empirically measure, assess resistance. That is such a good question. I mean, I, I, all I can say is, I mean, it's like when we've talked to people about doing change, the, 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 so more in the practical sense, it's always been like, you gotta, you gotta build it into your process that there will be resistance. And you've got to make sure that the people who are doing the change are not the same people doing the resistance management. Um, and it's so, I mean, we talk a lot in our book about kind of uh, white opportunity hoarding. It's just like this kind of subtle way that white people just get in the way and slow everything down and muck up the system. So I don't know, I'm gonna leave that on the table for a minute, Vivian, so I could stop talking and stop hogging the mic, but I think it's a really interesting question. So to you, Johanna. Um, yeah two things really stood out to me. I, I was I was thinking a lot about um, the process that Junior are talking about of kind of um, giving, documenting as you were going, um, the, how it goes with revealing, uh, having your race conversations. And I thought that would that was really interesting and something that I felt would be really uh, useful for a lot of people to kind of see that process in action as you're trying to, I think, what Meredith would say, kind of racialize them um, in it. Um, what is really what is really going on in that in itself is as a really important me measure, though it was meant to be, I don't think the the point of what you're doing. Um, and then I, I'm really interested in the thinking about the design learning, uh, the ways that it sometimes gets in the way. And I think this gets to the tension uh, to that Amanda was talking about um, of the top down bottom up approaches and the ways that design learning has been used to kind of just be a something to spin the wheel um, and have a lot of people working a lot uh, rather than um, shifting ways of doing and thinking more about kind of explicitly what you're thinking about the ways that it, it is done really well. Meredith, June, any initial thoughts and reflections? You're going first. Sure, sure I can, Meredith. Um, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself there. Um, 
Yeah, no, this is all super resonating with me. And I'm, I'm just taking so many notes when they're all talking. Um, and it's just made me think, and also with uh, Vivian's question in the chat altogether, you know, maybe one thing we could think about is um, uh, explicitly making part of our methodology this racializing notion, right? And so how this would look to, you know, uh, Joanna's question, like maybe in an RPP group, it's part of your method to actually introduce uh, ways of racializing our getting to know each other or ways of coming up with a joint research question, right? And then one kind of empirical assessment of the resistance would be um, how that partnership group comes to an aligned or misaligned project, right, at that phase, right? And, and the language we use to talk about that project probably will give us clues into what kinds of ways that we uh, value or view or frame uh, the joint endeavor, right? And maybe it's a, are some folks framing it in a race neutral way and are other folks framing it in a uh, explicitly racialized way? And that kind of alignment in the group might be a measure. That might be a totally bad idea. I'm just like, you're all in just inspiring me to kind of think about different ways to document and, um, and look at that from an RPP perspective, like in the, in the partnership itself. Um, so I'm thinking that's kind of, you know, our mindset here in our project is like, how do we introduce things into the process uh, to foreground race? And then how does that affect our group? And to other questions about resistance, um, we see lots of resistance, but it's uh, very much on a spectrum and very much related to our own personal histories and how we view the world uh, through, in our, through our racialized lenses. And so the resistance is often just um, very subtle differences in uh, our positionality and then how that how we end up talking about a problem, right? And so how I talk about a research problem and how my co-PI, Dr. Gomez, talks about research problem, like if you analyze that discourse, which we do in our work, like you would just see like, oh, to, like subtly different ways that we would see that. And it's just because of our, our racialized position, positionality in our history. So documenting that I think is also something that I would um, love to see. Great, thanks, June. I'd add that um, one thing that expansive learning research does address is that resistance is a measure of success. I mean, because even if we weren't in a, trying to racialize the situation and deal with um, institutionally embedded racism, changing systems um, creates all kinds of pushback. And if you're not experiencing that pushback, then you're not doing it. So we do a lot with really surfacing resistance, trying to frame it as a positive, um, and also help people to think about it as kind of a resource for change. So as they're pushing against the system as it is, what is the pushback that they're getting? And what does that teach them about how the, the system currently is or isn't working? in service of kind of anti, you know, an anti-racist approach to fundamental systems change. I wonder if all of you could talk a little bit about something that's come up across presentations, and that is that the kinds of dynamics you're trying to examine and interrupt are often below the surface, and they're often quite complex and messy. It's not, it's not the kind of neat process that researchers like to take on. And so I wonder if you could talk about you know, some, some concrete ways that, we, that researchers can think about being attuned to that in, the, in their work. Because I assume, and Meredith, I think you were getting this earlier as well, that it means doing your work differently perhaps than you've done in the past. So um, I wonder if folks have any, any oh, Amanda can unmute, um, if folks have any, any thoughts about how you can do that work um, through your data collection and analysis. Anyone? How do you surface what is below the surface? Um, so, and this is, this is where uh, we downplayed this aspect of our study, but it is really kind of the impetus for our study, which is it's a study of research use um, and also how data gets taken up. There's this concept in expansive learning called mirror data, and it's where you, it is a routine part of the process of expansive learning 
to reflect back to, um, to participants what their dynamics are. So mm -hmm. that get, I mean, I would probably do this anyway, um, but it kind of gives us all this like research backing to say, hey, here's how you're talking to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about this? Looks pretty kind of white centric to us. What do you make of it? And, um, and those kinds of challenges um, with data from their own conversations are really helpful. I think also like, especially in, bi in big systems changing work, there's, it gets really formal. Like here's the meeting where we're having the conversation. And a lot of the work that, that we do is, I mean, you could, you could say it's kind of behind the scenes, but especially with leaders of color who um, are pretty hesitant to, to bring up um, issues of, of race and racism at, at certain levels. So, um, so we, we try to do a lot of work talking to them about um, what kinds of spaces we can help create um, so they can bring some of those ideas in. Should they be bringing those ideas in? Um, and how can we support them? Thank you. Yeah. The other thing I would say is just kind of this, those places of the disjunctures. So, um, in, you know, having them mirror back what they say and having them look through it, but just like the things between, um, you know, what they're saying, what they're doing, what the policy is, what happens on the ground, um, in all those ways, those, those tiny disjunctures are kind of the places where you can push to start to see, is that just this one person who um, every time it comes across the desk just ignores it, or is that, you know, the, the whole team is treating that thing the same way, even though explicitly um, the policy is steps one through through five to, to do it. And the ways that those are uh, often around the same ideas about uh, race or um, um, kind of hoard, hoarding opportunities, et cetera. Yeah. And Joanna, your team has a really, um, I mean, when you put up the table, you have it concisely laid out the ways that you're going to try to account for the ideological, the, scheme, the schematic and the resources routines. Obviously it's, that's a very complex uh, process that plays out in the day to day. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I know that one of the things, um, and I don't mean to put you on the spot here, mm -hmm. but we were interested in knowing is how do you, how do you know when you're seeing change, okay. right? How do you know when you're seeing change in that process in June for you? Like, how do you know when you're seeing um, your infusion of anti-racist research in the conversation being picked up? Um, and I wonder if that's just when you're, you're looking for discursive cues or are there other ways you can see processes getting better? I mean, yes, we're definitely looking for discursive cues, but we're also looking for that, um, like we're looking for it to be, starting to be discursive cues that are similar and around um, lining up to something that could make sense to, to make change. So like we won't see the end result of a change, but, um, you know, specifically like in an equity policy, we can look at just the policy at itself to say like, is this something that just on paper would actually support students in a way? And we can, like it's, there, there are way, like you can see obviously like this is um, something that is not gonna be geared towards black students in particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, but if you do have that and then uh, when you're talking to people and they have a practice in place for how they're doing it, and that also is lined up to it, and you start seeing multiple people with that same practice in it, you start to see that alignment across it. And um, I think we're really thinking of like alignment and disjuncture as the places where we'll can pinpoint change or need to change. Thank you. Yeah, I would <clears throat> second. Um what Joanna was saying, and uh, that uh, goes looking for cues that lead us to concrete plans is one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the other on a more reflexive side, um, one thing that I've really enjoyed uh, that our team has tried to do internally is to have things like what we call family time in our informal mm -hmm. internal meetings where uh, we get to explicitly share where we think we're coming from and why. On, on certain uh, things. So for example, like if we share data back, 
with our partners. Um, that data share back could be interpreted in many different ways, depending on the, who's in the team and our racial positioning and our racial understanding and, and things like that. And it's actually those moments of conflict that uh, probably can make or break the partnership work, right? Mm -hmm. Either that becomes a, a big source of continued misalignment and conflict, uh, or it becomes an opportunity to uh, learn a little bit more of, of like why June got offended by that you know, or, or why we framed it uh, in terms of this or that, or, you know, did we feel guilty about that? Or did we feel, you know, empowered to do something about that? Like all these kinds of things. And uh, I don't know, we, we often lack to Meredith's point in the formal meeting, we don't have structures like that, right, to have those uh, kinds of conversations. So I just was one example of like, how do you infuse a, a technique or something into mm -hmm. the process, and then you could kind of see, how um, our conversations evolve about that over time. And uh, to Joanna's point, like I'd wanna see that become more routinized and institutionalized and that become more consistent, right? And if I see that happening, then on a process scale, like uh, then I maybe see actually more consistent discursive moves where, oh, we're okay with saying that, you know, like like we're okay with people saying like as an Asian American, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, I am interpreting you to say, you know, in this way, and if that becomes a normal part of the discursive practice, like that's a positive for me, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or, or you might see meetings devolve into um, just debating whether or not race should even be a thing, right? Uh, and, and that gives you the cue, right, about where we are as a team. So I just, to speaking to the chat here, I just wanted to give like a very specific grounded example of, of things I look for. Very helpful. Just as another kind of example, you know, I love the written and spoken word. We don't use discursive cues, and maybe it's because of the level of analysis we're at, the central office. It's like, a, it's like a, it's a miracle of the disconnect between how people talk and express themselves and what they actually do and how their systems work. So we are, you know, consistent with our framing. We're looking at premise shifts, so we're able to track. Okay, at this. Uh, the original school improvement planning process, for example, was based on these quite racist data practices. Um, and the SIP has now evolved to reinforce these other data practices, um, which seem more consistent with, with anti-racist work. And, those, and that, those shifts are evident in documents. They're evident in interviews with school staff who tell us what they're doing around school improvement planning which is so radically different than what they were doing before that that kind of talk um, really matters to us as evidence. Thanks so much. I'm gonna paste now um, a question someone, oh, that's, yeah, a question someone just asked in the chat um, that, that disappeared, but I, I would love to hear the panelists take this on to question from Sofia Rodriguez, who says, knowing this work is occurring at the district level and organizational level, this framework and language of expansive learning feels race neutral to some extent, given the conversation above, how do you invite leaders, decision makers into the conversation while having them acknowledge their racial attitudes and ideologies? What if they don't identify racial inequity, bias, racism, et cetera, as part of their current practices? And Meredith, maybe this is something that happens when you when you talk about um, we use the phrase disruptive facilitation. I wonder if uh, you all could talk a, a little bit about this. Um, well, I'll, you know, I'm not. I think Meredith should address part of it because it's specific to our project. But I think you know it raises some really interesting questions because it also, again, sort of speaks to what kind of work is possible in what kind of places, right? So, a lot of the work. I mean, the the, the kind of thing that that you know, again, from afar, that I hear June describing is to me a kind of process that would probably work in some ways much better in the kind of district I'm looking at, where there's just like huge fights between the district and teachers and about about what are the conditions of education and what are the things we care about there's not you're not going to see it just certain things was you know given the politics of what's going on certain things wouldn't be possible and so um there's much more of a denial about racism and bias in the process there's much more of a kind of culture of like we are doing you know so I think there's there's some interesting questions there about about 
um, what kind of what kind of strategy one needs to use in different kinds of places. Like where is power situated and how do you organize? You know, if we think about it as kind of an organizing problem, um, then I think it it helps us to kind of think about what's you know how we can approach it. I, I'm also thinking about like the kind of demographics of these different communities that people you know that, that you guys both describe working in and what again what becomes um, possible because the source of resistance in different places can be quite different, right? It could be, um, anyway, so I, just to get things started. Thank you. <clears throat> um, and I'll invite uh, Joanna and, and, and June to, to share how they kind of center kind of participants' racial experiences and identities in the conversation by, by saying that we don't do that. Um, uh, for as uh, as significant a part of the work or, or pre-work as I think those uh, other two studies do, um, partly because uh, at the level we're at, a lot of administrators have had a lot of that and not a lot of success in moving the work forward. And um, there's a lot of research, you know, on systems change, but also learning about the importance of, you know, confronting <coughs> racism, you know, and other challenges through doing the work. So again, just reiterate that that we use these these mirror data strategies to reflect to to first engage people in the real work of trying to redesign kind of the systems they're in, documenting how they're talking about it, what decisions they're making initially, and reflecting back to them the extent to which how they're actually working together in the group seems more or less consistent with, with an anti-racist approach. Yeah, I mean, all the discussion here is kind of expanding my thinking a bit as well about, um, to Amanda's point uh, and Meredith, your comments about the positionality of district leaders <clears throat> there's like a, probably like this massive variance in the positionings of different groups that are doing different projects, right? And so then uh, we actually do need as a field to have an understanding of what are the affordances and constraints of, of different positioning, right? So if you're in a situation where there's low levels of trust and just the basic arguments about the functions of schooling are, you know, are still not resolved, mm -hmm. right? Like you're not going to have this other library of strategies like available to you, right? For example, or uh, in our work, like we have a very different positionality because we, in seeking partners, we just made it very explicit. Like, no, we're working on race, you know. Like, you know, and so uh, mm -hmm. we already had like this self-selecting population of partners who would even talk to us, and so we are in terms of this bigger picture view, like we are only in this small slice of the variance, right? And then I will say, interestingly, even within our small slice, uh, there's a lot of variance about what kinds of understandings people bring uh, to race conscious work, right? And so um, even within like a within group um, variance, there is super interesting. So uh, maybe that I, I'm de deflecting the question by saying we actually need to fund like, you know, 500 people to have like, you know, like all these different situations. Marath, I wonder if is this um, the mirroring strategy you're using? Is that something that you're capturing your in your data collection? Um, how that how we're doing that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our data collection is like meta on meta, so we <laughs> we collect you know verbatim notes on the conversation they're having, and then we um, reflect those notes back to them as data and capture how they make sense of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this work, I'll just note, sounds like very intensive data collection. Can you talk a little bit about how you do that work of coordinating this, this massive um, data collection and then turn to the analysis? Because it does seem um, quite overwhelming. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I think that's uh, the point we're at right, right now is uh, intensive data collection. So we're 
I mean, we're trying to do it concurrently where we have, you know, specific groups of the team who are focused on certain kind of um, data collection, but it is, yeah, it's a, there's always, it's more time intensive than you ever think it's going to be. And um, it's really important. You want the insights from um, the data as you're going along, but uh, yeah, that, I, I would say that's a question that I'm grappling with and hoping that other people have some advice on how they manage that amount of data collection, yeah. Yeah, I love that stance as well. Uh, we mm -hmm. are also grappling with it and learning mm -hmm. as we go. So the, our best laid plans are um, mm -hmm. to, to resource it well in terms mm -hmm. of uh, making sure um, that we're resourcing the right personnel and the right number of personnel and being very honest about the time con time consuming nature, mm -hmm. right? So just things like facilitating meetings, building relationships, sending all the emails, following up, you know, like uh, you need to resource that well so that you're well positioned to collect this data. Mm -hmm. And you also need to resource well, the honest amount of time it takes to transcribe code memo and talk together as a team. So our team right now is a four person team. Uh, it's our two co-PIs and we have two full-time um, kind of research scientist postdoc positions. Um, and so uh, we, we've had to scope our project knowing that it's a four person team, right? And so then you make methodological decisions also to scope your cases and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And then we're also in the process of developing our weekly routines. You know, it's like, oh, we're meeting with folks this amount of hours, we're transcribing right away this amount of hours we're coding, we're getting together as a research team and like memoing for a couple hours, you know, once a week or, you know, we're trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And those are our best laid plans. But, uh, and I say that because of course, like um, where things are gonna happen, we're gonna try to course correct. I think it's also a kind of inherent tension in this work that when you're doing work that's about racial equity or justice or whatever, there, there are ways in which sometimes it feels like the, the research part of it can get in the way of doing the, you know, mm -hmm. the change making part, like, and it is, you know, I mean, both are important, obviously, we're all scholars here, but there are moments where it's just like, okay, you know, there, are, there is a trade off and, and in a world of, un, of limited resources, there are certainly moments where, where you have to decide, am I gonna, which is going to be prioritized right now? So that's like, I would say, just want to serve as a constant tension and especially kind of exactly what this has to be, large, unwieldy, complicated, unfolding, you know, work. And I appreciate too that across your presentations, um, what came up was a specific attention to the dynamics of the research team and the composition of the research team. And June, I thought it was so interesting too that you said it's affecting how you're thinking about what research use looks like and how researchers share research while acknowledging the value of all the voices in the room. I think that um, this conversation is a uh, nicely transitions to a question that Norma Ming just asked in the chat. And how do you prepare participant partners for the expectations that their interactions and conversations Will be analyzed and mirrored back to them and what does it take to build that kind of trust i would i would love maybe in our last few minutes to hear you really dig into that with and, and nodding to a question that was asked previously in in a context where folks uh, in school districts and elsewhere are dealing with backlash against critical race theory and what people seem to think that means in the wider world Um, I, I'm happy to start with this one just because uh, we have a few minutes left. Um, it's a really difficult question. Um, there are a couple things that we are trying out that I, I wouldn't, I don't give this as advice like do this, but as uh, what we're trying out. One is um, we're not really collecting data in, the, in the, these initial stages uh, because we do need to build that trust, right? And you need to build that into the process a little bit. Um, and so uh, we are uh, thinking we're, you know, taking general observation notes and memoing about our process, but we're not um, recording, for exa example, right? And um, doing that until we're ready as a team to do that. Uh, the second thing is, um, I think just anecdotally, uh, starting to have conversations with your research team about really sensitive information, uh, general information, right? 
and uh, talking explicitly with your team, including your research partners, about how you want to um, make sense of both kinds of, of data that you're collecting about yourselves. Um, and then the third thing would be um, constant member checking. And because we're, we have a co-design kind of ethos, it's like making sure we're in every step of the process, even in the writing, right? We're constantly maybe inviting the co-writing, the co-analysis, the, the you know, member checking there. Uh, because I think the ultimate shape of what you disseminate uh, will then look very different, right? And, and hopefully you build that into the process a little bit. But again, I think like imperfect strategies, we're grappling with that as well. And I'll just add briefly, uh, I mean, site selection is really important. We select sites like vampires do. We don't go anywhere. We're not invited. Um, and that's really important because uh, the, the districts we're in have some skin in the game and they've started the work and they've asked us to come in. And at this point, they know what we do. So, um, so that does help. Um, we, we, uh, we record everything. Uh, we haven't had a lot of luck getting when well, we're not there to get people to turn a tape recorder on. I think partly just because it's 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 awkward even for professional researchers to turn on a tape recorder. Uh, we feel awkward for a lot of reasons, not because we turn on a tape recorder. Um, so uh, it's just become a norm of how we work. And more often than not, central office staff ask us for the transcripts. Like they want the data. They're trying to capture their own thinking too. Um, I mean, I just had a super, I was just working with a superintendent who said, Can, do you mind if I record this? And I thought, you've totally forgotten I'm recording this. Um, but he's just working at such a level of complexity that he's trying to, to capture his own thinking. Um, so I guess our experience is, is challenging an assumption that people kind of don't, don't want to look at their, their practice or feel, feel awkward with that. Um, I don't, I mean, I think so much of this is like, there's some general practices here that we are, are true of any kind of conversation in these realms, right? Which is like, are we going, are, are people thinking like there, there's like a gotcha moment that that's happening or whatever, or people engaged in a long-term process that they know is going to take courage and they're going to mess, you know, and our expectation is they're going to mess it up three times. And that's just part of it, right? Is that we're all trying to do what is extremely, um, hard work. Um, and so the, the idea, I mean, is about analyzing conversations or sharing, you know, is, is getting people right. So if people are all in, I think it makes it a lot, a lot easier. Um, and it, it feels to be sometimes like the best kind of educational context, right. Where we are all invited in to like, to be engaged in what is, you know, necessarily a kind of learning and unlearning and all that sort of thing. Thank you all so much for your time today. I do want to acknowledge that I realize that the, the work we featured here today is, is qualitative. And certainly there are mixed methods and quantitative approaches folks could take to do to answering similar kinds of questions. I think Vivian underscored earlier a point, maybe you made Amanda that, you know, your theory should really be driving the approach. I mean, this is an obvious point in research, but um, I thought it was so interesting to hear June say earlier, the change happens in our interactions with one another. And June, if I heard you right, it sounded like you were saying, this is like really what we're focusing on. So you know the level where you're, where you're examining the dynamics that matter in your process. And, um, and that's where you're really focusing your, your data collection and analysis. Thank you again so much um, to all of you for taking the time um, to put these presentations together to answer our questions and thank you to the audience for joining us today. As Alicia had noted, has noted there's a website where resources um, have been posted and the slides will be posted from this talk and um, we've been recording as well. So thanks again um, and we look forward to continuing these conversations with all of you in different ways. Bye. <laughs>